I'm actually very surprised that I haven't done a video on this particular topic, given that it's a very, very common topic that's going to be, and may, most patients are actually going to be presenting to the hospital with this. Let's talk about Coriza. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at Coriza, which is also referred to as the common code. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button on our road to 7,000 subscribers. Do not forget to drop a comment, drop a like to show some support to the channel, grab your piece of paper and let's go. So remember that the Coriza illness is also referred to as the common code. You can also refer to it as nasal pharyngitis but most of the people are going to say the child has flu quote-unquote flu but that's something different so this is actually the commonest infection in childhood most of the children are going to be coming in because of a coryzal illness and remember most of these are going to be caused by viruses with the most common cause causing over 50 percent of the cases being the rhinovirus remember that this rhinovirus has over a hundred serotypes and each and every single time you actually get infected by a different serotype, you actually get symptoms. Now, the beauty about this is that your body does make antibodies, uh, neutralizing antibodies. And later on, as you are exposed to most of these codes, the frequency or the number of times you actually get the codes tends to reduce because of these antibodies that you're producing. And remember also that these rhinovirus infections are the most common during the fall and the spring and they're less common during the winter. But in our setting here, they actually become quite common during the winter because most of the times that's when most people are indoors, there's close contact, it's easier to transmit the infection from one person to another. The other causes include coronavirus, the respiratory syncytial virus, influenza virus, parainfluenza virus, human metanumovirus, enteroviruses, as well as adenoviruses. Remember that the transmission is via a droplet infection and one of the predisposing factors is overcrowding. If you have a lot of people in one area, another thing is poor hygiene if you're not disinfecting the surfaces and you have someone who's actually carrying the viral infection. Now, remember that the most potent deterrent, like I said, of the infection is the presence of specific neutralizing antibodies in the serum and in the secretions, meaning that if you've had this strain before, the chances of you getting it again are quite slim. So it means every cold that you've ever had was probably a different strain. So remember that this is going to be induced by this previous exposure for with the same strain or closely related virus. Now remember that contrary to most belief, most popular belief that the cold weather actually predisposes you to getting the viral infection, that's not really true. So susceptibility to cold is not affected by exposure or to these common codes is not affected by exposure to cold temperatures, it's not affected by the host health or even the host nutritional status. Even if you eat a bunch of fruits, you're still going to get the cold because it's a viral infection. Also, upper respiratory tract abnormalities such as enlarged tonsils or adenoids do not put them at risk of developing the common code. Now, what are some of the clinical features? Remember that we have a short incubation period of about 24 to 72 hours. This may begin with certain characteristic symptoms such as a scratchy feeling on the throat or the sore throat, which is later followed on by sneezing, uh, rhinorrhea. Sometimes they may have lacrimation, tears from the eyes. Their eyes may be red. They may have some nasal obstruction. They may have some generalized body malaise. The temperature is usually normal or they may have a low-grade fever associated with some irritability. And remember that usually if you have the pathogen that's a rhinovirus or coronavirus, usually you don't have so much of the fevers. The nasal secretions are often watery and profuse during the first days of the flu, but then they eventually become mucoid or purulent. Now, contrary to most belief that most people think that if you get this purulent discharge, you get a bacterial infection. That's also not really true. So remember that the mucopurulent discharge does not always indicate a super added bacterial infection so it's not an indication to start this patient on antibiotic it can be as a result of shedding of the epithelial and even inflammatory cells resulting from the viral infection so it's very difficult to actually distinguish between the viral and bacterial infections unless if you do your pcrs and you do your couches but of course those will take some time for you to get some results then of course also the nasopharyngeal and nasal blockage can actually result in this respiratory distress in the young infants remember infants are obligated nose breathers so if you get this obstruction in the nose it can flare up and actually result in 
this acute respiratory distress and this is what will often bring them to the hospital then you get this narrowing of the airway and the pharynx due to this irritation that's going to be there and this can be causing a dry hacking cough which can sometimes be persistent so make sure you reassure the mother that everything is okay you don't really need to keep treating this child then of course the cough is usually mild and often lasts into the second week and most of the symptoms due to this uncomplicated cold are actually going to resolve after 10 days if they still persist and they become worse after 10 days you must reevaluate this child for other possible diagnoses Children also that have common codes that are due to viral infections may also have cervical lymph node enlargement on your physical examination. Remember, they may also have excessive lacrimation, which is often due to lacrimal ducts being blocked in the nose. And remember that the, the health education is very, very important. You should advise the patients that the especially the parents the mothers are going to be worried the fathers are going to be worried so please do advise them that the codes are self-limiting and usually are going to last about three to four days and there is no specific treatment that's going to be curative there's nothing that you're going to give that's going to help cure this common code. So this is going to be helping reducing the anxiety of this patients, anxiety of the parents, anxiety of the caregivers, and also saving them that excessive money that they're going to be using to trip to the doctor and back home, just to be told that the child is okay, it's just a common code. So just keep advising them on this, keep this health education. Then remember that persistent of the symptoms, like I said, beyond 10 days or the fever, should actually pro prompt you to actually evaluate this person for a bacterial superadded infection, rule out any sinusitis, evaluate for any acute otitis media. Then you may sometimes have the eustachian tubes being blocked, and once this has been blocked, this can lead to serous otitis media and congestion of the tympanic membrane. So it can cause some ear discomfort, it can cause also some impairment in the hearing at that particular time. Then you may also have a purulent sinusitis or otitis media that may result from a viral infection itself, or it may be as a result of a superadded bacterial infection. And remember that these codes that these individuals are getting, especially in those that are in the bracket of asthmatic patients or those with chronic bronchitis, it can actually exacerbate these conditions. And purulent sputum or significant lower respiratory tract symptoms are very unusual with myeloid virus infections. So if you get a child that's actually having lower respiratory tract symptoms, they're having this purulent sputum that's copious in amounts, then you should actually think of other things as opposed to rhinovirus infection. Diagnosis is often clinical. We can do a polymerase chain reaction to actually check for the viral agents, but these are usually barely isolated in the samples that we send to the lab. So usually our diagnosis is just based on our clinical symptoms. A differential diagnosis includes a foreign body in the nose, but remember patients that actually present with this are going to present with unilateral nasal discharge, which is going to be either serosanguinous or purulent discharge from one nostril. Another differential is allergic rhinitis, which also tends to be happening with certain seasons. You may also have the snuffles of congenital syphilis. Of course, this is a severe type of rhinitis where you have this bilateral serosanguinous discharge that's coming out, which can also cause some excoriation of the upper lip and actually lead to fine scars. And remember that nasal strictures may also ulcerate, leading to a flat nasal bridge. Now, how do you manage these patients with a common code? Here are the principles of management. Re you we relieve the nasal congestion, we control the fevers, we manage the pain, and plus or minus antibiotics. Remember, antibiotics are not routinely recommended for patients that actually have a common cold. And I will keep stressing this point. There is no specific treatment for a common cold that exists up to date. Now, how do we relieve the nasal congestion? We can actually advise the mother to actually get some nasal saline drops that she can put in each nostril whenever necessary. Or sometimes if the congestion is quite a lot, you can actually do it about hourly or even two hourly. Nasal decongestions and decongestants rather are not really indicated for especially children that are below the age of four years. We generally want to avoid this, but for older children, we can actually use them with caution. Now, the caution is this. We do not want to exceed three days whenever you're using these nasal decongestants such as ephedrine. The reason being that once you stop using these after you have used them for quite a long time, you get what is known as a rebound congestion. So these are not routinely used in our setting. They're also only just reserved for refractory cases. And even in these refractory cases, we don't really exceed three days. Antihistamines, on the other hand, can also be used, but also these should be avoided in children below the age of four. We generally have the first generation antihistamines, which have a side effect of sedation. So when you give them, the child is going to be drowsy. They'll often tend to sleep a lot. A drug is chlorpheniramine, which is the periton that we often give. 
This can actually be used to relieve the rhinorrhea, but remember these are also not indicated for children below the age of four. We can also use sometimes the second generation antihistamines, uh, which are usually non-sedating. So drugs like cetirizine, loratadine, these may be used especially in allergic rhinitis. When it comes to treatment of common cold, they actually aren't as effective as the first generation um, antihistamines. And uh, tafinadine actually should not be used in children because it has a potential of cardiotoxicity. We can alternatively also use some intranasal ipratropium bromide, two sprays of 0.03% solution about two to three times a day. This can also help relieve nasal congestion. Now for the fever and the pain, we often tackle this by using some analgesics, the best being paracetamol, our cowpaw, given at 10 to 15 milligrams per kg, either four to six hourly. So your maximum is actually giving it four times a day. So we want to avoid giving any cough syrups. The reason being that if we suppress the cough, especially in the young infants and younger children, we have this mucoid secretions that are going to be retained in the bronchi and this can actually predispose them to the spasmodic coughing, the wheezing, atelectasis and sometimes even suppuration. So generally we want to avoid this cough mixtures and this cough syrups in children. And antibiotics are actually of no benefit in the common code because remember the common code is caused by a viral infection and they are only used if the secretions actually become very prevalent, the fevers continue to be persistent and they exceed 10 days. And if the child develops any bronchopneumonia or any signs of lower respiratory tract infection, then we tend to actually prescribe these antibiotics. Remember that secondary bacteria infection is very uncommon, but it should be treated with antibiotics if suspected. And there are some other remedies that have been tested in different populations, things like vitamin C, zinc, um, Echinacea, which are pretty much not so effective. There is no evidence that's actually supporting that these things are actually beneficial in the common code, though you can still prescribe them. Some complications include otitis media, sinusitis, laryngitis, bronchiolitis, exacerbation of asthma, as well as bronchopneumonia. How do we prevent this? Remember, there is no vaccine for a common code because of a myriad of strains actually do cause the common code. Some polyvalent bacteria vaccines citrus fruits, vac vitamins, ultraviolet lights, glycerol aerosol, glyco aerosol rather, and other remedies that grandmothers usually use actually do not even prevent you from getting a common code. And the, the effectiveness of actually how they help in the common code is yet actually even to be established and the benefits. But the key most thing is actually keeping your environment clean. So hand washing and pre infection prevention, using any surface disinfectant to actually disinfect any contaminated environment, this is what actually reduces the spread of the infection. Isolate patients that actually have the common code to prevent the infection from spreading. So if it's a child, they should at least stay at home and not go to school and infect others with the same viral infection. I really hope you enjoyed this video on chorizal illness or the common code. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel so you never miss any such amazing content every time I post to Zambia and beyond. Until next time, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Bye-bye.